Reading between the lines of the chaos unfolding in fiat land, it is clear that there is a desire to implement a choke point, a desire by regulators to restrict on and off ramps into the world of Bitcoin and beyond. And so as they increasingly put the knives to the throats of these different centralized entities, it becomes ever more important for us to have the right tools for the job ahead of us as we enter deeper into the then they fight you phase. One category of tools are peer-to-peer -to -peer ways to acquire and trade Bitcoin. I have done a whole playlist that I will link in the description down below and that I recently did a Twitter and Nostra post on, which I would invite you to check out. If you don't have at least one of these methods that you're comfortable using, you are simply not thinking adversarial enough. And then another welcome category are ways to improve the self-custody experience. And one of the common pain points is the lack of fail safes when it comes to self-custodying their coins. And so they would rather leave them on exchanges or perhaps with other kind of mixed custody solutions that still involve centralized entities, even despite all that unfolded over the last year. And so that is why in today's video, I'm excited to be talking about a new proposal called Op Vault, which would bring, among other things, for the very first time, the ability to intervene with an attempted theft of your Bitcoin. Let's jump in. Before we get into things, I want to give a special shout out to Anthony P, who made this very generous super thanks. Super thanks, if you weren't aware, is one of the ways that you can support a channel. Uh, I turned this on not too long ago, and so this was the very first one. Uh, so Anthony, if you're watching this, much, much appreciated. For others who might be curious, you can find this button in the lower right uh, underneath the videos you can see as follows. But again, big shout out to Anthony for supporting this channel. None of this is currently sponsored, as you can probably tell. So that really does help in a big way. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin pleb, and all around raging capitalists. And today I'm excited to be going into Op Vault. There is a whole history of what can more broadly be known as covenants that stretches all the way back to 2016 and potentially even earlier that have typically come with very significant trade-offs. This latest proposal for a specialized type of covenant has some really attractive traits and appears to have a lot of support in the community. So there is a very good chance that this becomes a reality. But what is it? What does it promise to bring to users of Bitcoin? Are there any trade-offs or downsides that we should be aware of? Today, we're gonna pick it all apart, so you're not gonna wanna miss a thing. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends, as always. It is a pleasure to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. If you like this type of content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our growing merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin-related content, including a whole slew of tutorials on how to acquire Bitcoin, secure it, privacy best practices, running your own node, the Lightning Network, and more. With all that out of the way, though, let's go ahead and jump into the meat for today. We're going to first start with a basic rundown of what this is, and then we'll get into some of the use cases. All right, so you've probably heard the nomenclature or the term vaults before. And a vault is really a specialized form of what's called a covenant. And a covenant is a set of conditions attached to a Bitcoin transaction that allows a user to determine when and where the Bitcoin can be moved. And importantly, this includes in subsequent transactions. So it would be like me predefining that, hey, this Bitcoin that I own can only be spent after a certain amount of time and only to the following address. Now, there have been prior iterations of this that typically involve the use of one-time use keys to try and pre-sign transactions, but this brought with it a lot of shortcomings and also complexity. Then you started to have what we might call pre-computed covenant mechanisms, like op check template verify or CTV. You may recall seeing this over the last year or so championed by developer Jeremy Rubin. Ultimately, CTV was left to the side because it still had some shortcomings and I think introduced more edge cases than folks felt comfortable with. And so fast forward to today and we have a new proposal from developer James O'Byrne, which comes in the form of a new op code or operation code to be added to Bitcoin script or opt vault with an accompanying opt 
Unvault. So what does this promise to do? In a nutshell, users will be able to number one, predefine a time delay that would have to pass before any coins are spent. But then you accompany that with number two, where you create a recovery address that would be in a totally different wallet, which the vaulted funds can be sent to at any time. And so what this means is that for the very first time, you could intervene in case of a security breach. Remember all the kind of drama earlier to start this year with Luke Dash Jr. talking about how he had his you know, Bitcoin confiscated and stolen through what later proved to be a very rather complex uh, setup. But this could add an important new layer of security for the average user. In addition to taking down, you know, your backup phrase, your seed phrase, all that good stuff, you now have this mechanism to intervene if, for example, there was an attempt to move the funds out of this vault. We'll talk more about how that would actually look and work. And similarly, imagine you're a business that wants to accept Bitcoin, but you're not really comfortable with the trade-offs that come with keeping it with a centralized exchange or some other custodian provider, even if it is a sort of mixed multi-sig setup, such as what folks like Unchained Capital and others perform. And so one analogy here would be it helps you get most of the convenience of a hot wallet while reducing the risks associated with it. That's a pretty big deal, especially when you think of business users. And indeed, I suspect that we will see the Unchained Capitals and the Casas of the world integrate Op Vault as an additional layer of security. So with that foundation, let's now take a closer look at how this actually works. So as we can see in this diagram, this comes directly from some of the GitHub documentation, which I will leave in the description down below. You should definitely read it from James's own words. He's got a great white paper write up as well for this that I will also link. But we can see that the vault has a number of stages. First, you start with this vault transaction, which is what encumbers certain UTXOs with an op vault script invocation. This means you are applying restrictions to how these UTXOs can be spent. Namely, there's the spend delay, so how much time needs to pass before these UTXOs can be spent. And then there's also the hash of a trigger transaction, which is what would pave the way to later undo this. Maybe you do a partial withdrawal or a full withdrawal from the vault, etc. And then you can kind of see here how you have what might be a default withdrawal path where you basically initiate a withdrawal transaction and then after waiting the spend delay, that transaction will go through and occur. Or before the withdrawal confirms, you can spend this into a recovery transaction. And these outputs or these addresses, as you can see, are controlled by the recovery key. And so to try and make that a little bit more visual and practical, we can look at this great example flow diagram from River. I will link this as well. They put a great piece together as they normally do in their sort of education content. But you might have something like the following where you've got your savings and your spending account. You click on that savings account and you say, hey, I wanna set up a new vault, right? You give the vault a name, you set a backup address, you set the time delay, and then you add a certain amount of Bitcoin to the vault to initiate that initial transaction. And you have your recovery key that is generated. Once you then create the vault, you'll have something like this that shows you how much is in the vault. It gives you a reminder that, hey, the Bitcoin in this account can only be sent after a certain amount of time has passed or you can recover into that backup address at any time without any delay. So that's really cool stuff. But one of the big questions you might be asking is like, okay, cool. I, I like the ability that I can intervene if something were attempting to happen here, but how do I detect that something is happening in the first place? And I think we'll see the rise of things like watchtowers we have watchtowers already for the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which are basically, in the case of Lightning, computers that monitor for malicious channel closing transactions that attempt to more favorably reflect your partner on the other side of the channel. We could see a similar concept take hold here, where you've got a computer looking at the blockchain, looking for the initiation of a withdrawal transaction that would attempt to move those UTXOs. You could receive some sort of alert 
And then you could immediately use your recover transaction for your vault. That coupled with the time delay would make it very unlikely that the attacker is going to be able to get their hands on your Bitcoin. So I think even for like a personal cold storage setup, this could add a helpful extra dimension. But then again, you could think of a more hot-ish type of wallet, such as what you might use for a business or what have you. And so as the Bitcoin economy continues to grow and becomes more circular, having something like this as an extra fail safe really is important. If you talk to a lot of business owners, I think that you would hear that feedback echoed. So now that we've talked through how it works, again, at a high level, if you wanna go deeper, I will leave some of the resources in the description down below. But let's also talk about some of the potential risks or trade-offs to this. For one, you could kind of ask the question, well, is this really like practical? If we're trying to make and encourage self-custody for the masses, for everyone, is adding the additional recovery key really practical? Is that just yet another thing that I have to keep track of? I don't know. It remains to be seen. I think a lot of this will come down to the wallet or signing device makers in terms of how they integrate this and what the sort of user experience looks like. This also carries with it some of the more general concerns that have often come with covenants more broadly. Things like, hey, does encumbering all these UTXOs with all these special spending conditions, does that impact fungibility in any sort of way? What about censorship resistance? Could a government or regulatory authority somehow influence who is allowed to spend their UTXOs and in what way and in what fashion? I'm not really sure how that would actually look and manifest in reality. And I don't think that those concerns are specific to OpVault. But I really don't see OpVault adding anything incrementally new that hasn't already been sort of thought about. And while there are some risks in what we just discussed, I think they're pretty minimized, especially in the context of the upside that this update could bring. Now, there is still some complexity as well with things like fee management, right? How do you reasonably pre-calculate fees? Well, you sort of can't, right? Especially if this is a transaction that's only going to be made, you know, years from now in the future. And so the original proposal used something called ephemeral anchors to help with this, uh, but has since opened up to other possible solutions. And so it's not yet clear what the final answer to that will be. But net net, in my view, this seems worth it given both the upsides and potential risks. I think it does a good job of minimizing the latter while introducing functionality that I think a lot of users would really value. And that gets to a really common theme and pain point when people talk about self-custody. So with all that, let's conclude today's video and also talk about what comes next with all of this. All right, so what is next for Opcode Vault and Unvault? As of the beginning of March 2023, this was officially assigned to BIP 345, so you can follow along on the progress with that BIP. These new opcodes will need to be folded into Bitcoin via a soft fork, so that will go through the process that we've seen in prior instances, whether it's something like Taproot, etc. It's yet to be seen what sort of method will be taken to bring this, whether there'll be a speedy trial process or what have you. So there's still a lot of debate and review by the community, but just from an early sense of some of the momentum behind this, I think this will probably go, like whether that means later this year or maybe next, who knows. But exciting stuff nonetheless to see a very constructive proposal, a pretty elegant proposal to do some of the covenant functionality that has been discussed and do it in a way that appears to be very thoughtful, careful, risk minimized, etc. But I'm curious to hear what are your thoughts? What do you think of Op Vault or what is now being known as BIP 345? Let me know in the comments down below. Are there related topics you'd like to see covered in future videos? Let me know as well. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like. Use the share feature underneath this video. That really does help get this to a broader audience. And I think that is especially important during these chaotic times of regulators clearly trying to choke off on and off ramps and poke at self-custody. I think the more tools we have at our disposal, the better. And if you are so enamored with this content, you want to donate to a pleb, which really does help me continue to make these videos. You could do so in a number of ways. As we saw earlier in the video, you could donate through a YouTube super. You can also, if you have something like Get Albi, you can just click on that browser extension and immediately send some sats that way. Or as you will see momentarily, I will have my lightning address and strike account on the final page. But for now, my friends, we'll go ahead and leave this here. 
As a reminder, every sack counts. And until next time, I'll see you then. Yeah.